good? Yes. <laughs> All right, I'm trying, guys. I'm trying. All right, so, um, let me open us up with another word, and then we'll go ahead and get into the passage. If, if you guys remember, we're going through the book of, of Acts. Um, let me go ahead and open us up with a book where we'll get started. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we just pray that you would speak right now. We pray for your presence to just fill this room and for your Holy Spirit to reveal more and more truth right now. We pray that, that we would be challenged, that we would be encouraged, that we would be blessed today. So we thank you, we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now just to get started, um, how many of you guys, how, how, how many of you guys actually get sick often? Raise your hand if you get sick all the time. Anybody? You guys are a little afraid to share? All right. Uh, of you, like, never get sick. All right. Well, we got some people that are like, oh, I have iron stomach. Right? I can handle anything. All right. Okay. And I used to be among you guys. Um, actually, I graduated high school, and they awarded me with 13 years of perfect attendance. All right. 13 years. I remember everyone at my high school, like, they were like, what? Like, he never missed school, and, all, and I, like they made me stand up, and everyone's like cheering, and I'm like, yes, yeah, yes, I went to school every day for 13 years. Um, and, and so, it was like this epic event, it was actually partially like false, because I, I do remember I was bedridden in second grade with chicken pox for one week. That was the only time I ever missed school, right? So technically it was 10 years perfect attendance, not 13. Regardless, they awarded me with 13 years of perfect attendance. And, and it was weird, because... Like, in America, people don't go to school that often. <laughs> like, they're always finding reasons to get out of school. They're, they're trying to sneak out. Um, I know some of you guys in this room have probably been experts at stuff like that. Regardless, um, <laughs> I see some smiles. Anyway, uh, regardless, I wasn't one of those people. I, I liked going to school. It was logical for me. If I'm okay, I'm going to school. And then also, because I'm Korean, Unless, like, I couldn't actually physically get out of bed and get into a, a seat, then, you know, I, I should go to school. Like, that, at my point in my life was, like, the purpose of why I existed, right? Simple as that. Now, why do I bring all this up? I bring this up because this past week, I was sick for most of the week, um, which is a very unusual for me. Now, now granted, all right, I'll be real, it's diarrhea. <laughs> Granted, this is something that I deal with relatively frequently. Um, <laughs> again, more information that I should not share. Um, but regardless, normally it's something that I get over after a couple days. And sometimes I've had it where it's like crazy painful and I'm on the throne like 15 times within one night. Right? I've had those experiences. It wasn't that crazy. right? It was, I was still on the throne often, but not as much. But what was different this time was the length. It took a lot longer. I was I was sick from Tuesday morning up until you could probably say yesterday. It usually doesn't last that long for me. But the interesting thing was that every time I went to the throne, and this is a euphemism by the way, every time I went to this throne, I felt like a piece of my soul was being taken away from me. Right? And I was like, oh. Right? And then I would leave the throne. And I'll, I would feel like a sh like a shell of my former self, and so I would go and I would I would be struggling to just walk, right? And, and and that was what I dealt with all week was that it seemed like like all the energy inside of me had been emptied out right? every single time, and I dealt with that for a whole week, right? And, and every time like I, I didn't have that much pain, there was a little bit, but in general. Every time I was trying to do some work, I would sit at a computer and I would get ready to start doing something, I was just like, all the energy would just drop. And I would be like, ugh, I didn't want to lie down. <laughs> and I went through that the whole week. So the irony of that is today I'm talking about Pentecost. Pentecost is the day that power came down, fire came down. When, when, and I went through a whole week where I had no power. God's funny. He gave me this sermon illustration of the anti-illustration of what I actually want to share about. Right? He, like, the power was taken away from me for an entire week. And I just got it back. Like, yeah, yesterday. And that's what I've been going through this week. So anyway, to get through this. You know, we've been going through the book of Acts. We've been going through 
um, th this journey, and this is a big moment. Right? You look at Luke and, and the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, he's building up this big crescendo, and there's this crazy musical going on. Mary's like, oh, Magnificat, and then like uh, Zechariah's like, uh, so they're all singing and then and then there's these these angels and there's this big choir and then chapter 2 Jesus is born it's written very simply but it's an extremely important event and that caps off the rest of Luke that everything centered around that birth of Christ here in the book of Acts chapter 1 you know Jesus is there he's teaching them he's like you guys um, you know it's wait it's chill right here don't do anything um, he's like, there's, there's this Holy Spirit that's going to come. You guys are going to do this, this, this. And then he just pieces out, right? And, and they're, he's gone. They're confused. And, and, and then, like last week we talked about, they kind of made a, a silly choice and, and did something else. They, they chose another. They chose this guy, Matthias. And then, bam, chapter 2. The Holy Spirit shows him. And this, from this point on, characterizes the rest of the book of Acts. And everything that happens from this point on is, is really um, a byproduct of the Holy Spirit coming. Right? So this is not the first week we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. We're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit a lot. Because the rest of chapter 2 and onward just continue to show how the Holy Spirit has changed everything. Okay, So that's what we're going to talk about today. Holy Spirit. Right? So, you know, Forget about all that stuff I was talking about with diary and stuff like that. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, okay? So, going to Acts 2. Following with me. Um, listen as I read. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazing, as aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our, own, in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. So, Acts 2. Holy Spirit comes. Crazy things happen, right? You have this, this rushing wind comes in. So you, you have these people that are sitting in a room, and honestly, it was about 120 of them. It was probably in, a, in, a, probably in an area, of, probably roughly the size of this room right here. So they're just chilling in this room, and then all of a sudden this, this wind comes. Right? They're probably like, what's going on? Whoa! And then... You see this, these tongues of fire, which is coming down. And all of a sudden, they're resting on their heads like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> got these tongues of fire. And then all of a sudden, they're speaking other languages. And all the other languages start coming out. And then they come out, and people that, that have come from all these different areas recognize the languages that they're speaking. And there's this big commotion, right? What starts off as a very small, small event among just around 120 people, expands outward into a big public scene, which will continue on next week when we get to when Peter actually speaks up. Okay. Let's talk about what's going on right here. Now, to, to really get into this, I, I have to you know, really focus on the original Pentecost. So, so for those of you that don't know, the original Pentecost, Pentecost basically means 50 days. Okay? 50 days. And it means 50 days from Passover. So traditionally what this is supposed to represent, this, this signifies when the law came down from God to Moses on Mount Sinai. Right? So the Israelites have left Egypt. They've been freed from physical slavery. They're, they're standing around Mount Sinai, which is a mountain that's covered in fire. Right? It's another huge epic event. Right? 
and God is bringing his law. That's what they celebrate. And so this actually became a big festival, a big week-long festival, where all the males, all Jewish males, had to return to Jerusalem to celebrate this festival. This is a big event. There's a reason why everybody was congregated in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was bustling at this time because of this. Okay? Now, I'm the wrong way. Um, all right, this is, I messed up this slide, but just follow with me. So basically, what I want you to get from this is that there are two major parallels going on here between the Old Testament and the New. In the Old Testament, you have this people, this people group, these Israelites. They're being freed from physical slavery under the Egyptians. And they've been brought out into this desert. And there was a cost that was required. There was a Passover. There, were, there was a lamb that had to be slain or firstborns that had to be killed for their freedom, right? There was a blood cost for them being brought out of physical slavery. And then further, that, that, you know, that, that, that freedom that was given to them also led to stronger relationship with God. This is the, the moment where God makes a covenant with them and says, you are my people. You are now my nation. This is a very significant incident that's going on in the original Pentecost. Now on the other parallel is in the New Testament, there's a similar thing going on. Because now where Moses led the first exodus out of physical slavery, Jesus now leads the second exodus out of spiritual slavery. So you're having people that are, are, are in bondage to sin. There was a price that needed to be paid. Jesus died. His blood was shed so that people could be freed. And then this now leads to this day of Pentecost. Where now you have the Holy Spirit coming. And now you have an even closer, a more intimate relationship with God. Not only is God dwelling among you, God now actually dwells inside of you. There is no deeper intimacy than you can ask for that. But God himself to live inside of you. And so when you actually really think about what Pentecost represents, it represents this. It represents freedom and greater relationship with God. This is a very significant event. This is a very important thing that's going on here. With Pentecost, you have freedom. Freedom from sin. Jesus shedding his blood for you. And now you have this intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. There are these parallels that are going on here. Now, I'm going to try to not bore you guys with all this information. But there are some crazy parallels when you compare the two. right? Now, the scales are different. In the Old Testament, you have this big mountain on fire. You have all of Israel, which actually represents probably about 2 million people. And this is a big group of people at the bottom of this mountain, right, watching this big event that's going on. New Testament's a much smaller group. It's probably about the size of this room, 120 people, right? And also in the same way, you had wind and fire in both of them, right? We had the, the pillar of wind, the pillar of fire that's represented on Mount Sinai. You also have the room filling with a rushing wind and tongues of fire that's showing up in the New Testament as well. There's parallels in both, different scales. In both cases, they get bored waiting, right? In the Old Testament, Moses takes 30 days, like, oh, where is this guy? Let's build a golden calf, right? This is like one of the most silly events in the Old Testament, but again, it's, it's a consequence of, of, of them creating something to do while they were waiting, right? They didn't wait patiently. In the same time, we talked about last week, the choosing of Matthias in the same way was people not, not simply waiting, but doing something because they wanted to, right? Both cases, they couldn't wait. They had to do something. But both cases led to amazing things. In the Old Testament, it's the birth of a nation. You could say it's the birth of Judaism. The law is given, right? In the New Testament, it's the birth of the church. You'll see later on in the, in, in the end of chapter 2 that 3,000 people are saved. And from that point on, you have the birth of the, the actual church, the birth of Christianity. Now again, here's where it diverges. If you look at the Old Testament... The, the, next, the next step from this is not necessarily a positive one. They go into 40 years of wandering. 
They go into two years and years of disobedience and ultimately become a lost generation, right? So if, if you really compare the Old Testament with the New, there's the big difference. The New, the Old Testament, you could sense that they did it. They always wanted to go back to Egypt, and they're fighting God with this. But in the New Testament, these are people that are scattered across all the nations that end up becoming these epic martyrs <coughs> that, that lead the church all over the globe. It's a difference between obedience and disobedience, right? In the New Testament, these are people that have chosen to be disciples. And once they're empowered by the Holy Spirit, they don't hold back. They go all the way. You know, if you start to study the different apostles, there are different legends on how, fur, how far they brought the gospel. Every single apostle has, like, a different story. And, you know, for those of you that know, like, like uh, St. Thomas... It's basically understood and accepted that St. Thomas went as far as India and planted a church there that exists even today, right? That's pretty far, walking from Jerusalem to India. Think about that. Is that something you want to do? Hey, hey guys, let's go for a walk. All right, where do you want to go? India. <laughs> That's really far. He walked all the way to India. You know, they, they talk about, like, the Spice Road, right? And, and Columbus, like, you know, could try to sail around to get to India. Thomas just walked, <laughs> right? And not only did he walk, he planted a church that even today people say, we're part of the church of St. Thomas. This is a church that has existed for thousands of years. And there's even more of a recent story that, that people actually believe that Thomas didn't stop at India. They think that he kept going some people even think he, he made it all the way to Korea, <laughs> right? Isn't that crazy? There's actually some stories recently of like these archaeological finds of like these little crosses and different things and like these different legends that they actually believe there's a tomb of, of, of Thomas, I, I, I've heard, actually in Korea. I don't know how true this is, but that's crazy, right? That this man did the impossible, he went from Jerusalem to India, possibly all the way to Korea, because he was empowered by this Holy Spirit. And this is a man that everyone tends to, to knock. He's like, oh, doubting Thomas, oh, right? But honestly, I, I respect this man, right? This guy <laughs> did some crazy things. And that's the example that's been placed before us. The models that we have after Pentecost are people that went the distance for the gospel. That's the difference between the New Testament and the Old. The Old Testament, another generation of, uh, of disobedience. But with the New, people that, that took the gospel as far as they possibly could. That's a challenge for us. And yet all this, I always ask myself, why don't we ever do anything for Pentecost Sunday? You know, I preached on Pentecost Sunday last year when I was at my previous church at Unset, and I was like, why don't we do anything? Because I, I started to think about it. It was only very recent that, that I even thought of Pentecost as an actual holiday, right? Growing up, I don't think I've ever heard a preacher say, by the way, today is Pentecost Sunday. I've never heard that, right? I guess I grew up in a Presbyterian church, so we don't talk about stuff like that. <laughs> but, but regardless, I, I never heard about Pentecost Sunday. And I started to study about it. There are very few churches that do anything, and the few that do, it's like, it's kind of simple stuff. But if you really think about all the stuff that I've talked about, the birth of the church, the birth of Christianity, right, the Holy Spirit arriving and empowering His people, this is just as significant as like Christmas and Easter, honestly. I would put it at the same level. So let's think about that. We got Pentecost Sunday coming up on June 8th. Let's do something. <laughs> All right? Let's, you know, let's, let's, let's come up with a tradition that I think honors what actually happened on Pentecost Sunday. But remember, it's the Holy Spirit that gives us His power. It's the Holy Spirit that, that empowered the gospel to go as far in, in all these different directions as possible. Now, I have a lot of information to go over, so I'm going to try to do this quickly. Um, but I wanted to at least touch upon what's going on in the text. Right? You, you have 
Pentecost, you have the Holy Spirit coming, you have tongues. Right? And this is an area of controversy among many Christians. Now it's very clear in this passage that the tongues that are being spoken about are actually existing languages. Right? Because people recognize the languages right afterwards. So what's going on is tongues are actually existing languages in this text. But if you look in 1 Corinthians 13, there's kind of that question mark of, well, what about angelic tongues? <coughs> and Paul also talks about in 1 Corinthians that those types of tongues require interpretation. Someone has to be able to interpret that tongue, right? Now, for those of you, you might come from different backgrounds. Some of you might have no clue what I'm talking about when I say the word tongue, right? Other than the actual physical, like the tongue in your mouth. Maybe beef tongue if you like eating that stuff. I don't know. Um, regardless, some of you might not have no, no clue what I'm talking about. Others be like, oh yeah, I pray in tongues. Right? And some of you come from more of that background of what, what they call the charismatic background. Right? You know, where you just... Like, and, and for me, the first time I ever experienced people praying in tongues was when I was in high school. Or no, not high school. I was in college. And I was in college. I was at this big conference. It's called Oil, One in Love. I was at this conference. And it was like surround sound tongues. And I didn't know what was going on. I was just like, like all around them, like, what's going on? And I remember, I was like, really, like, I was very uncomfortable. Because I was, you know, I wasn't very strong in my faith at that point. And I was being challenged with something I'd never seen before. And I felt that everybody in that room was praying in tongues. So we started, I was in a small group. We started actually saying, yo, yo, you pray in tongues? You pray in tongues? Like, no, man. And we found out there's basically like one church in that whole room that all prayed in tongues, but they were praying so loud it sounded like everybody was praying in tongues. It's crazy. Regardless, this has been an area of controversy. Right? Some people embrace it. Some people think it's it's made up. Some people think like you know not it's not something that you shouldn't do. There are a lot of different opinions about stuff like tongues. And spiritual gifts in, in general, right? Now, I have to address this now because as we continue through the book of Acts, we're going to see more and more crazy things. We're going to see healing. You know, we're going to we're going to see, like, prophecy. We're going to see all these things. So I, I have to address this question because people often ask, do these still exist today? Does tongue still exist today? Does prophecy still exist today? Does physical healing still exist today? A lot of people ask this question, okay? Um, so, there are basically two extreme sides, right? On one side, you have the people that are called the cessationists. Cease means to stop. So they believe that basically gifts, like they, they stop to exist, that they used to exist, but they serve the very specific purpose. And once that purpose was met, they disappear. So what they say is, there are no post-apostolic gifts. What they mean is that after the, the era of apostles ended, all gifts ceased. Right? And the reason why they say this is because they come up with this logic where if you look at the book of Acts, it, it, it follows with, with three segments. Right? First you have Jerusalem, then you have Judea, Samaria, and then you have to the ends of the earth. And if you look at the three um, breaking outs of the Holy Spirit, it follows that trend. Right? And what, what the cessationists say is... The, the breakout of the Holy Spirit, the, the gifting of tongues and all these different th things that happen at that moment, it's God giving His confirmation to that segment, right? Those three phases. And then they say, therefore, now that that purpose is over, now they don't exist. That's what cessationists say. Very logical, but in my opinion, not really that biblical. Because there's nothing in the Bible that actually confirms what they're saying. They're just taking a biblical trend that they see and they're extrapolating it and making a truth out of that, right? I disagree with them. On the other side, you have what they call the charismatics. Now, charisma is actually the word for gift, right? It's not like people when they see the word charismatic, like, oh, those people must be charming. <laughs> no, it's, the word means gift, okay, charisma. And so charismatic means that you exercise those gifts, right? And so this is the extreme that says, okay, spiritual gifts exist, and they must be exercised. And some groups within this goes to such an extreme that say, you know what? If you don't start to manifest or show a particular gift, then you're probably not saved. They go to that extreme. Some of them do, right? Or it feels that way. Regardless, 
two extremes. Either there are no gifts, or everyone should have gifts, basically. Now, I must say that within my own family, I have this tension. Now, most of you know that my uncle planted this church. He's on the conservative side. So he's the one's like, uh, gifting, uh, he's like, I don't know. Um, but, but him, he's all like, oh, bogum, bogum. He's like, gospel first, right? So, so he, he would be more conservative, right? He would be more like, ah, gifting, you know, you know, don't worry about that stuff. But then on the other side, I have this uncle, this chaganapa that I call hallelujah, hallelujah, huh, right? He's basically the leader of all charismatics in Korea, right? For some of you that know who he is. And so he's the one who actually told me, he's like, I was like, what? And he's like, you should pray about having the gift of tongues. I was like, where? Why? Like, what? Well, what's that going to do for me? He's like, I'll give you one reason. Before I could pray in tongues, I, I could not pray for more than an hour. And I, I, as hard as I would try, I could only pray for one hour. And then I would get tired. But then when I started praying in tongues, I would pray for, like, for hours nonstop. No problem. And I was like, okay, Chaganapa, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so these are, like, I have both extremes in my family. Now, to be personal, like, I haven't fully figured out where I stand. I'll be honest. I'm still trying to figure out where I stand, but I will say I'm somewhere in the middle. Okay? I do, I do believe, honestly, that if you believe in a God that created the world, then of course the same God who's all powerful, who's all knowing, of course he can he can still allow spiritual gifting to exist. That's that's a no brainer. But when I look at the sides that, that exercise gifts all the time, there are issues I see, right? In my mind, I see elements of spiritual immaturity, right? Especially when you compare it to 1 Corinthians 14, where Paul talks about how you're supposed to exercise these gifts in a way that edifies everybody. I've never seen that model in existence. And I question that. Regardless, I feel like I'm things, pulling things astray, so I want to bring it back. If you go to the passage, the main thing that comes out is that, the most important thing that comes out is that the reason why, they're, or what they are actually saying in those tongues is they are praising the wonders of God right? it's not so much about the gift it's about what the gift is actually doing it's glorifying God and to me when it comes down to it that's what I want to see I want to see God glorified you know we can argue about these different things we can do things different ways but when it comes down to it I want to see God glorified through the things that we're doing right if it's through the gift of tongues, sure, fine. But he needs to be glorified. Now when you, when I talked about this a, a couple weeks ago. But before Christ was willing to send out his disciples, there were three things that he wanted to see them grow in. There was teaching. If you look at Acts 1, teaching. There was also training. He wanted to make sure they had the experience, the expertise of being with him for three years. And lastly came the Holy Spirit. It was those three things. Three things combined that, that Jesus felt was necessary for them to be effective witnesses to the end of the globe. And in the same way, when I look at, at the quote-unquote charismatic church, I kind of feel they're missing in some of those areas. When I look at the conservative church, they're obviously kind of neglecting the Holy Spirit to some extent. Right? So brothers and sisters... We need to grow in all three of those areas. Grow in our training, our understanding of the Word, our, our, our experience in, in the ministries that we do, as well as our relationship with the Holy Spirit. So brothers and sisters, Pentecost, let's embrace the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's allow Him to do amazing things in our lives that, that we can be that next Thomas that goes to India, and maybe even to Korea. Right? Who walks there? All right, let's not walk. <laughs> let's use what God has given us with transportation. <laughs> but let's take the gospel to, to the far reaches. Right? And let's see God glorified through that. Whether it's through tongues or not, let's see God glorified. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, we praise you, and we just pray that would help us to understand 
what Pentecost means of, of you sending this Holy Spirit, you sending this counselor, you sending the, this, this, this wonderful being who would reveal your scripture, your truths to us. That we can have an intimate relationship with you because you dwell inside of us. Oh, we thank you, Father. And we pray that we would embrace this power, that we would not limit you by what we think you're capable of, but that we would actually be willing to go as far and to do whatever you desire us to do for the sake of your gospel, for the sake of your kingdom. So be glorified today, Father. Teach us more about your spirit. But all things glorify your name. We thank you and praise the name of Jesus. Amen.